Ten ways autistic trauma and Southern Baptist trauma piled on top of each other. Number one, growing up autistic, I couldn't read social skills, so people were constantly getting mad at me and telling me everything was my fault, but I didn't even know what I'd done wrong. And Southern Baptist youth group told me that I could make a mistake and someone would know I was a Christian and see that mistake and not want to believe in Jesus because of it and then burn in hell. And I might not even know that. The takeaway for both, you're constantly making mistakes that ruin everything. And you might not even know it. Trauma! Number two, rules. Southern Baptists tell you all the time that life is not about like, just follow all the rules and Jesus will beat you over the head if you don't. That's not how it is. And then they exactly teach you that it is. It's like, say one thing, mean another. And then with autism, it's kind of the same thing. You need structure, you need regulation, you need a plan. So rules are great. But then people tell you to do things that don't make sense. And you're like, burn it all down. It doesn't make sense. Um, so together... The takeaway was this constant stress of like, if you follow a rule, maybe you'll be happy, but you might get this horrible feeling that you did something wrong. And if you don't follow a rule, you will also get this horrible feeling that you did something wrong. When towing the party line becomes your autistic sense of structure, then questioning your beliefs is not just distressing spiritually and emotionally, it upends your actual ability to regulate yourself. That is how I would regulate myself growing up. If I felt like I was having a meltdown, a lot of times it'd be like, did I do any sins? Did I do anything wrong? Am I being persecuted for Jesus? That's how I handled things like conflict with friends. It was just like, go through the rules. Legalism was part of my ability to self-soothe. Number three, autism and Southern Baptist Church both resulted in me in hating my weird feelings. Autistics often have mental health issues, not surprising considering being constant outsiders and never good enough. So it's not unusual for an autistic to have, say, intrusive thoughts or something. And then you go to church and they say that the weird thoughts in your head are God. Alternatively, the devil. On top of this, autistics often have needs that other people don't have. For example, we all stim. Stimming is biting your nails, playing with your hair, playing with a fidget toy, clicking a pen, anything. It's, it's a thing you do somewhat subconsciously to help clear your brain and help your thoughts work. Autistics need this at a much higher level than the average person. So when I felt this horrible need to move, among other impulses that other people didn't have because we had different needs, there was always the possibility that that was God telling me to do something in my mind. I'm thinking of a specific time I went across an aisle and talked to a stranger at church camp because I felt like God was telling me that she was struggling. But in hindsight, I probably just like physically couldn't stay still and felt like I was going to have a meltdown. And when you're a kid and don't know that you need to move more than other people, it's really easy to think that that's God, especially with the whole live music experience. The takeaway is reading way too much into thoughts and feelings that otherwise you could just let pass and move on or are even actually really important cues about what you need to function. So it both caused problems in my life mentally and socially, but also impeded my ability to take care of myself. Number four, autism and purity culture specifically. I actually have a whole post on Instagram about this. Just check the guides tab in my profile and look for the religion section. And there's a whole post on purity culture and autism. Things like purity culture tells you you need to cover up your body with specific clothes and they can't be too tight or too loose or something. And then as an autistic person, that might be what you need sensory wise to have clothes that don't feel like they're scraping against your body all day. I spent my summers in 90, 100, or even 110 degree weather wearing Bermuda shorts and t-shirts um, when I really should have been able to wear a tank top that rides up a little bit at your belly and short shorts, just for literal safety. And the only shorts we could find that long were a sensory nightmare and felt absolutely awful on my skin and I hated them. There's so much more I talk about in my post, but the short version is purity culture teaches you that your body is evil and wrong. And autism often makes you more aware of your body because of sensory concerns. So you have this wicked body, but it's impossible to ignore. And you're sensing the theme of the day. That makes it hard to take care of yourself. If you hate your body, but your body needs extra care. Mm. Five, my experience in the Southern Baptist Church made it very hard for me to rest because I felt like there was always something more I was supposed to be doing for God. And when you're autistic, you often need more rest. Something that might be just a little exhausting for someone else could be a lot exhausting for me, especially when it comes to socialization. I'm an autistic extrovert. I love socialization, but that doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean that I don't need to wind down after it. It is impossible for me to come home from a party and then just go to bed. I'm going to be up for probably about two more hours at least. I have to wind down. And when you add to this the whole stress of feeling like... <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't know what's going on, but you're somehow letting everyone down by not reading the social cues. And church saying, okay, well, we have activities Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, whenever, lots of nights uh, and different services. Oh, and so many volunteer opportunities. And there's this unspoken message that the more you do, the better Christian you are. It creates an atmosphere where once again, you're sensing the pattern. Caring for yourself as an autistic person is not good enough. That rest could be evangelizing time. Someone could burn in hell because you didn't feel the need to evangelize. That rest time, you could have been praying while you rested. Why didn't you do more? This leads me to number six, specific schedules and activities being seen as godly. For example, reading your Bible in a regular schedule every day. So often I would try to read my Bible and I'd just zone out, which is what my body needed. I was exhausted mentally all the time. It's kind of sweet when you think about it. Like this autistic kid goes to read the Bible and can finally relax. But no, I felt sinful and evil because I couldn't focus on Jesus. My church would regularly have these read the Bible in a year challenges. And I would promise to do them. And I never would. And I worried about the wrath of God because I'd broken a promise to God. Autistic brains tend to work in chunks. Maybe you have a special interest and you just obsess over a thing. You like something in a chunk. Maybe you get a special interest in a craft and you do that craft four hours a day for a month. You like it in a chunk. Now as an adult working from home, I schedule my days in chunks. I don't work on a little bit of this, a little bit of that every day. I'll have a day where I do a bunch of laundry and a bunch of like cleaning. And then another day I might do a bunch of work on the book I'm writing and make like 10 videos online. But so much of what was seen as being a good Christian required doing a specific thing every day in a small piece. That's not how my brain works. My brain needs time to rev up to an experience and time to rev down. It does not jump from little thing to little thing. It dives deep, stays there a while, and then comes back. So reading my Bible for five minutes every morning was never going to work for me, but I had no idea, and I felt like a horrible, evil person for it. A better plan would have been for them to suggest uh, read your Bible special time once a week and get like a special treat and sit down and eat candy while reading your Bible for an hour. That would have been more feasible for me. Same thing with praying about certain things every day. I forget important things exist. I'm too busy focusing on another chunk. It doesn't mean I don't care. It just means my brain is far too deep in something else. Anyway, we're running out of time. Number seven. This is more of a religion in general thing, but so much of worship tends to be overstimulating or understimulating. When you start putting rules on how someone is allowed to focus on God, you automatically make it so that some people will not be able to focus on God. A lot of Southern Baptists see things like waving your hands during worship is distracting, but I needed to stim. I couldn't focus on Jesus if I wasn't moving. But then I'd go to like a Pentecostal church or something and sure they're moving, but the music is so much louder and there's flashing lights and fog machines. And now in order to move at all, I'm overstimulated. The solution to this is just to be more chill about how people interact with the service and also maybe just have an overflow room where people can interact. And oh yeah, like online services. Just not judging people for swaying in the back makes a huge difference. I would count down the songs in youth group because it was so overwhelming and I would like pray to Jesus that they would be done and then they'd play a fourth song and I'd be like, no! By the time I was in college, I could pretty much disassociate on command. I didn't know what that was what I was doing. I taught myself, I practiced to get better. But I'm pretty sure that started in high school or middle school because so much of my life was just, you're in this uncomfortable situation and you just have to deal with it. So you learn to just send your brain away. That's not a good sign. For a while during youth group services, I would go into the back and dance. And eventually I was told I couldn't because it was too distracting to walk out of the room in front of other teenagers. The dancing wasn't distracting. They couldn't see that. But just walking? No. Oh my gosh, we have one minute left. Rapid fire. I grew up with this weird idea of stillness being associated with holiness. Maybe you sit still in church. Maybe you're still and pray. I couldn't be still and I felt like I was less holy. Nine is tied to this. The girls with better social skills, even if they were nasty and mean. They were always the one who got picked to sing a song from the perspective of Mary at Christmas time. I tried. I really tried. I wanted to be the Mary girl that everyone looked to and was like, wow, she could hold Jesus in her uterus. This strong but unspoken idea of like the holiest of women always being socially apt and conventionally attractive, of course, and uh, relatively relaxed did not work for me. And I felt lesser. I really wanted to be holy enough to be seen as someone God could pick for a special task. But I never was. I always sang the comedy song. And you know what? I'm making money from comedy now. So it worked out. Although one year I did dance Sugar Plum Fairy Dance at a fundraiser and that was fun. Number 10, this is my experience with Pentecostal actually, not Southern Baptist, but when people become 
aware of your disability, you become ground zero for everyone who wants to be a faith healer and they will harass you and you feel like you're not welcome. It makes you feel like you're in a lower level of Christianity because all people see is how much you need to be fixed. 